Hello everyone. I am presenting a case report on triple retinoid syndrome with persistent sciatic pain. First case history. A four-month-old female baby developed diffuse swelling in the left gluteal region after one month of age. The infant developed pain over the region one month ago and was diagnosed as abscess for which incision and drainage was done at an outside hospital. Further, fever with progressive increase in size of the right buttock and swelling and wetness over the right lateral malleolus was noticed in the last week for which the infant was brought to our hospital. Antenatal and postnatal history was uh, nil significant and no significant family history was uh, there. And on examination, port wine stains over the gluteal cleft in right gluteal region was noticed. Diffuse swelling involving the lower outer and inner quadrants of bilateral gluteal region was also noticed. Systemic examination was unremarkable. Further, the blood investigations revealed features of sepsis with anemia, neutrophilia and thrombocytopenia also were observed. So on examination, local examination, uh, these are the diagrams depicting port wine stains in the gluteal cleft and right gluteal region. In the second image, swelling of uh, bilateral gluteal region can be uh, seen. And the third image uh, is the image depicting a normal bilateral lower limbs with no limb length discrepancies or soft tissue swelling or hypertrophy of the lower limbs. So uh, as the initial investigation, ultrasound with uh, Doppler evaluation was done of bilateral gluteal region that showed diffuse thickening of subcutaneous plane with multiple small cystic lesions within the hypertrophied or uh, thickened subcutaneous tissue uh, with no color uptake. And on color Doppler evaluation, a tortuous uh, tubular structure could be seen in the mus intermuscular plane in postrolateral aspect of right inferior gluteal region and the tortuous uh, venous structure was showing good color uptake, compressibility and venous spectral pattern. The structure was seen to be extending till the upper half of thigh in the intermuscular plane. And the possibility of the vein causing adjacent to the sciatic nerve was also considered. So with the ultrasound and the Doppler, color Doppler findings, uh, the possible diagnosis of a lymphatic malformation with an associated vascular malformation was considered and MRI was uh, further suggested for further evaluation. So MRI with contrast of bilateral luteal region and bilateral lower limbs was taken and uh, in the present slide, we are seeing axial images of the gluteal region in T1, T2, fat set and post contrast sequences showing diffuse hypertrophy of bilateral gluteal region, uh, subcutaneous tissue, with, uh, which is appearing heterogeneously hyperintense in T2 and STIR sequence and showing heterogeneous post contrast enhancement in uh, post contrast sequence. Also, Within the hypertrophic subcutaneous tissue, multiple small stick areas could be seen, which is showing fluid signal intensity. So these features were suggestive of a lymphatic malformation, likely a microcystic lymphangioma. In the next slide, we are seeing axial images of the pelvis showing a tubular hyperindent structure along the course of right sciatic nerve that is seen passing through the intermuscular plane and through the sciatic foramen, it is seen entering the pelvis and then draining into the right internal iliac vein. And in the post-contrast image, post-contrast enhancement of the tubular structure was also observed. So these features were suggestive of a persistent sciatic pain. In this slide, the stir sequence and the post contrast sequence depicts the dilated torches lateral marginal vein and the dilated torches short subvenous vein. So, diagnosis a five month old infant presented with port wine stains and swelling in the gluteal region. Radiological evaluation revealed features of microcystic lymphangioma with persistent sciatic vein and dilated lateral marginal vein and short subvenous vein. On the basis of the above findings, the diagnosis of clippal trinoid syndrome was made. 
the infant was managed with IV antibiotics in view of sepsis. And then the later, later the infant underwent liposuction of bilateral gluteal region where lymph and fatty tissue was obtained. Further, regular follow-ups were advised on discharge. Moving on to discussion, Flippel-Trenoy syndrome is a rare congenital disorder with an incidence of one in one lakh people worldwide. It was first described by two physicians in 1900, that is Flippel and Trenoy, after whom it was named. It is characterized by vascular malformations, that is capillary, venous, or lymphatic, and bone or soft tissue hypertrophy. Any of the two features are enough to diagnose flippel trenoy syndrome. It occurs sporadically and has no sex predilection and usually manifests at birth or childhood. Unilateral lower extremity is the most common site involved, and the cutaneous capillary malformations can be in the form of both wine stains with the limb or soft tissue hypertrophy. Venous malformations may involve both superficial and deep venous system. Superficial venous malformations include varicosities, persistent embryonic veins, and deep venous malformations are in the form of hypoplasia, segmental ecclesia, or aneurysmal degeneration. The lymphatic deformities include primary lymphedema, cystic hygroma, lymphangiectasia. It can be microcystic, macrocystic, or mixed, which can lead to lymphatic insufficiency, congestion, <coughs> or lymphuria. Visceral vascular malformations can also develop, and the various systemic organs involved include brain, cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal system, or genitourinary system. Common complications seen are thrombosis of the vessels in the extremities, recurrent pulmonary emboli, lymphedema, hemorrhage secondary to vascular malformations. The etiology is still unknown, but it has been hypothesized that it could be caused by a mesodermal abnormality during fetal development. Persistent embryonic veins are characteristic for triple trinonoid syndrome, in which the lateral marginal vein and persistent sciatic vein are more common and usually they should regress before birth. The lateral marginal vein is a superficial vein, whereas the persistent sciatic vein is part of a deep venous system. During embryonic life, the large primitive axial vein drains the lower extremity. When there is persistence of this axial vein, which normally should regress, it is defined as the persistent sciatic vein. The persistent sciatic vein is found in three morphological forms. Complete, when the persistent sciatic vein arises from the pleteal vein, ascends to traverse the sciatic notch and terminates draining into the internal iliac vein. Upper persistent sciatic vein arises from the minor tributaries of upper thigh and passes through sciatic notch to end in pelvis. And lower PSV is seen in the distant and middle third of thigh and opens into deep femoral veins. Moving on to imaging modalities, serial scanograms, computer tomograms, or other standard radiographs radiographic studies can be done to assess limb length discrepancies. Ascending and descending venography is useful for assessing the anatomy of the deep veins, including embryologic veins and their connection to deep venous system. Doctor ultrasound is usually the first imaging modality used for differentiating vascular tumors and vascular malformation and to assess these malformations. CT and MRI are beneficial for visualizing the extent of these lesions, hypertrophy of the muscles or bone, or presence of the malformations and uh, the abdominal pelvic involvement of these malformations. Prenatal diagnosis of KTS by ultrasound and MRI and has also been uh, described in various um, articles, and syndigraphy may be utilized to assess the regional lymph node and bone vascularity. Moving on to the management, non-operative medical management is the main modality uh, for uh, treatment of symptomatic KTS uh, patients. Limb length discrepancies are usually managed with heel inserts or compensatory shoes. However, if there is discrepancy of more than two centimeters, surgical intervention should be considered. Sclerotherapy or embolization are considered for varicosities not responding to medical management, but patency of the deep venous system should be confirmed before any intervention. Persistent sciatic vein is treated usually with sclerotherapy or embolization or endovascular radiofrequency ablation is another option that is coming up these days. My, these are my references that I've used uh, in this paper presentation. Thank you.